Good morning, Woodland. If you would, with so many people in attendance, scoot towards the center of your section. Scoot towards the center of your section so we can fit more people in. Thank y'all. What an awesome morning to be called to worship by children. Out of the mouth of babes, we get commanded to go out and proclaim the gospel message that God has come in flesh and redeemed, right? Every single one of us to himself. That's what we're celebrating this Christmas season and Christmas tomorrow. So if you would, stand and proclaim the gospel message, calling each other to worship. Oh, come all ye faithful. One, two, three.
Good morning. Oh, that's so nice. Welcome to worship here on this beautiful Christmas Eve morning. It is so good to see this house packed full of smiling faces. If we have not met, my name is Peggy Degler and I am the weekday preschool director and this is my husband, Ed. We all have special memories of Christmas. When I was a child during Christmas, we were either traveling to Florida to visit my aunt and uncle or we were in another part of the U.S. or the world, and we, the trip to Florida was impossible. When I was 10 years old, we were living in the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains in India. In 1960, when I was 10, the celebration of Christmas was very limited in India, since 98% of the population is Hindu and Muslim. With almost no Christians to celebrate Christmas, there were no Christmas trees. During this time of year, Christmas trees are available for sale on almost every corner in Wake Forest. In India, we had to purchase our Christmas tree through the U.S. Commissary in Delhi, then it was transported over 100 miles to where we lived. And what I remember about that night, we had 40 people, 40 fellow Christians that lived in the area where we lived over for a Christmas Eve celebration for a traditional American Christmas. Looking back, I'm thankful for those traditional Christmases we had as a child when I was growing up, despite some unusual hurdles that we experienced along the way. Peggy, I think your Christmases were a little different. <laughs> they were. I grew up here, and I lived out in the country in Nightdale, and we would just go out in the woods behind our house and cut down a Christmas tree, <laughs> um, usually a cedar tree, and bring it in and decorate it until my mom had to have one of those fancy aluminum trees with the color wheel. Any of you remember those? My mom saved her money to get that Christmas tree and she was so proud of it, but my dad did not like it. So he went out into the woods and chopped down a Christmas tree anyway, so we had two Christmas trees. That was a, that was a fond memory. But one of my fondest memories that is so different for Ed and I, he grew up with older parents and an only child and I grew up one of four children, and Christmas was chaotic in our home. We would go to my grandparents' house for Christmas, and they were even poorer than we were, and we would walk in, and the coffee table would be full of ribbon candy, orange slices, and nuts. Anyone else have that at Christmas? And there would be Christmas presents under the tree, knee-deep, as Ed says, and there would be something for anyone that came to visit my grandparents. It might be a bar of soap or a, pack, a pair of socks, but anyone that entered my grandmother's home left with a package, and, and that is a really fond memory for me. Well, and her mom continued that tradition that I remember going to her home, every flat surface in her house was covered with candy, cakes, pies, you name it. The, pe the peanut butter balls and the chocolate covered cherries were my favorite. But it was a special, special time and the presents were knee deep. They were. So whether you're here today as a family of one or a family of two like us or a family of 20, we're so glad you're here today. And no matter the size of your family sitting in these pews or at home watching us today, I hope that you feel a part of this Woodland Church family, which is not only huge in numbers, but huge in heart. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that we get to come together as a church family. Whether we've known each other five minutes or five years, we can call one another family. 
and we can come together on this Christmas Eve day and celebrate the birth of Jesus. That is why we're here, Lord. Our existence is because of Jesus. And I pray that as we share song today and story and scripture and words, that our hearts will just be full to the brim with love. And if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus, Lord, I pray that their hearts would be touched and that if they feel inclined to ask questions, that they will. This is a loving congregation, and everything we do is out of love, the love for Jesus. Let us continue now, Lord, this celebration with one another, with our hearts open and our ears open to receive the message that you have for us today. Lord, thank you for the sounds of the children that fill these walls, because children make Christmas special. We love you, God, and we praise you for all that you've done for us, and it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Let's continue worship, please. Stand and let's sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. One, two, three, four. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy Sinners reconciled, joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn. This scripture is from Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The angel's name was the angel, excuse me. <laughs> the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be? since I have not had sexual relations with a man. The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
and consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who, who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. <laughs> I'll be reading Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. The word of God for the people of God. joy and the expectation of Christmas. I feel it every year. I love it and as a father I have, I have begun to enjoy Christmas through the eyes of my daughters. So where Christmas may have lost its magic maybe when I was a teenager it has been fully restored. And I hope that in this season where we can all enjoy and see the magic of Christmas not in the the presence that we give to each other and we receive from one another, but in the hope and the expectation of renewed life that we have in Jesus. And to know that every Christmas season is a time for us to, to look afresh through the eyes of God, what he has done for each of us, in that he has come and brought life to us here in this story, Luke 2, but he's also coming again, right? So he has given us his spirit, and we get to enjoy the fullness of life in God this very day to celebrate the forgiveness of sins, the, the redemption we have from the grave, the return from exile that all of us have experienced in our life, living in the wilderness and in darkness, and knowing that he's coming again to restore all of this, this beautiful creation of his in glory and in majesty. So the song that we sing next, not only does it proclaim the beauty and the majesty of Christmas in this season right now, but it proclaims the beauty and the majesty of Christ's return. And so as we lift up our voices, think about what expectation you have in your life today, not the gifts that you get to enjoy through your grandchildren and your children and your spouses, but in the gift that you've received from Christ Jesus so stand with me and let's proclaim the gospel and the returning of King Jesus in the age to come. Joy to the world. One, two, three, four. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let's see, 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 let's see
We praise you for this morning, for the new life and the hope that we have in the work of the gospel that has been completed through Jesus. Lord, thank you for his life and his ministry, even in this age today with us now. Lord, we praise you for the work of your spirit in our lives. Lord, we pray that our ears would hear the truth and the beauty and the majesty and see and behold rightly the glory of King Jesus this Christmas season. We pray in his name. Amen. We're reading Luke 2, uh, verses 8 through 20. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over the flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Thank you all so much for that, and thank you for uh, being here and being a part of our worship of the Lord and our celebration of all that he's done for us, his uh, good gifts to us in Jesus, and uh, the privilege that we have of remembering that. Uh, you know, our, our lives are usually built around rhythms like this, and so let me give you just a handful of things that uh, you'll see, you have seen, and will continue to see in our worship service together. Uh, you may have noticed uh, lighting of, uh, of candles with the reading of Scripture. You know, sometimes it's not just that we light candles because they smell really good. We've got a lot of candles lit at our house um, around this season, and uh, it smells great, but the reason why we light candles is just a reminder to us that the passages of Scripture that we've been reading really are pointing us to the one who is the light of the world, that uh, we live in the midst of darkness, and you may have darkness in your own life, or you turn on the news and you see darkness on social media, there's darkness everywhere that you look, and the good news for us that we can remind ourselves of is that Jesus has come to be light in the midst of darkness, and um, so we want to remind ourselves of that. This is um, a, a season where we can pause for just a little bit. Now, you think pausing, uh, and you, maybe you laugh when you hear that around Christmas. I don't know what life is like around your house, but there's not a lot of pausing or a lot of resting. 
Uh, there's a lot of running and forgetting. And, uh, you know, one of the things around Christmas time at our house that happens is um, it took us a number of years. Ginger and I have been married for uh, a, num- a number of years before it finally struck me that my gift to her was to let her buy her own gifts. Anybody else uh, get a witness? Yeah, that's all over the place. That's right. The men are like, amen. And so, like, my, you know, when it, when it comes to my wife buying gifts, she's been planning all year all the different things that she was going to get and why and how they were special, and she's got a story behind every gift. And, you know, they've been, they, they've been chosen specifically for the moment. Uh, for me, like perhaps for many of you, I walk into a store. It's just random. It doesn't have to be any particular store. It's just I pick a store a year, and I'm like, Ginger, you're getting something from here, you know? And I walk in, and I wander around for a little bit, and then as time ticks away, I just buy something and uh, show back up at home, and I wrap it up because I pretty much know anything that I buy, and I try to get my wife a gift a year that's from me so that she only has to go to one store when she returns it. And that's kind of the way... So if you're that way as well, it can happen. But as we, as we pause today, it really becomes a, a chance for us to think about not just what happened and happens at Christmas, but why. A few minutes, we'll, we'll bring the kids up here, and it'll be absolute and utter chaos. And it's great. We love it. I love the chaos. I love the noise. I love kids screaming. I love babies crying. It's kind of this picture for me of life. You know what I mean? I just, I love, I love the noise. So I think it's a great thing. And in a few minutes, we'll do that. But I don't want us to forget today why we celebrate what we celebrate. It, it's easy for us to forget the why of our traditions, things that we do in our homes, things that we do with our families, maybe things that you do at work, where there, there are certain traditional things that you do. I come from a very tradition-oriented family where, you know, there's all sorts of, of, of uh, things that just have to be done. And it's like, this is the way we've always done it. And, and we always do those kinds of things. And sometimes you, you might ask, well, why are we doing them? Why is it that at Christmas we celebrate the birth of Jesus? Why do we uh, spend time together as families or as friends or as, as the church, as the people of God? And there's a passage of Scripture that I want to read to you today and talk about for just a moment before our kids come forward, and that's in the book of Philippians. There's actually a song that's in Philippians chapter 2, and you're more than welcome to take the copy of Scripture that's uh, there in front of you if you want to look at this passage as well. Um, if you have the thick version, it's on page 1010. If you have the thin version, it's on page 666. But it's okay. You can still look at it. So. <laughs> but Philippians chapter 2 says this. And just hear these words. Like, just listen to them for a moment. Because the point of this passage is the Christmas story. And, and I know it's not like the baby in the manger part of the Christmas story, and that's a big part of it. And it's not the wise men, uh, which is a, a part of our telling of the Christmas story, and it's not, you know, the donkeys and the sheep and the, all the other things that you see uh, perhaps associated with Christmas. But this is the Christmas story, and here's what the Bible says. It says, to have the same mind or attitude in you that Christ Jesus had. All right, so this is... This is where the song starts, and this is where God sings this song, if you will, as a way to explain to us why Christmas is so amazing, right? When we talk about, man, at Christmas, there's kind of this, if you will, the the magic associated with Christmas. What is it that makes Christmas so important? Why would we do the things that we do? And here's the song, that Jesus, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. In other words, he is equal with God because he is God, but the point of the story at Christmas is not for him to just come say, hey, man, I'm equal with God and you people aren't. Like, I'm, I'm better than you in some uh, way, obviously, as God. But it, it's not, the point was not to exploit the fact that he is God. There was something else that Jesus has in mind at Christmas, and it is this. Instead, he emptied himself. So the one who is God at Christmas, we celebrate him coming and emptying himself, pouring himself out, literally. This, the, the fact that what God has done at Christmas is to, is to open up the container and pour himself out to us. And how does he do this, the text says? By assuming the form of a servant. So the one who is the form of God comes and takes on the form of a servant. 
right lowly, not the highest, not the most important, not, not the most significant, but the one who is the servant. You can jot down or put in your mind, this is from Isaiah 53, the one who is the suffering servant who comes. This is the form that our God has taken on for us. And in assuming the form of a servant, he says, he takes on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as man, as humanity, as human being, he did this, and this is powerful. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So when we start Christmas with him being born in the, in the manger that we have over here, he doesn't stop there. The Christmas story doesn't end there at the manger. It proceeds all the way to the point of death, even death on the cross, this, the, the text says, kind of the, the real Christmas tree, if you will, the cross on which Christ died. For this very reason, the text says, for the reason that he was, had, had come as a human being and then was obedient to the point of death, God highly exalted him, lifted him up, gave him, bestowed on him, gave him the name which is above every other name. In other words, recognize in Jesus' obedient life and his sacrificial death and his exaltation, his being raised up from the dead, recognize who he really is as God, having this name which is above every other name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, and even under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what's the whole point, right? It's not just what happened at Christmas time that's of value to us, and and it is valuable. When we remember all of the the trappings of Christmas, if you will, they're, they're still good, and they're still meaningful, and it helps to point us to the real reason for the season that we're, that we're in. Not just that there was a little baby that was born, but that that child lived an obedient life. And why did he do that? Because in taking on humanity, he took on your humanity and my humanity, and he lived obediently because you and I won't, right? We all, we all know that there are plenty of, th- of ways that we don't want to obey God and haven't obeyed God. And so he comes to be obedient for us And his obedience takes him all the way to the cross where he can die yet again in our place as a substitute for us, the Bible says. Our sins have separated us from God. The book of Isaiah tells us that it's not that God's ear is too deaf that he can't hear our prayers or his hand is too short that he can't reach out and save us, but our sins separate us from God. And so what what Jesus does on the cross as God He takes our sins onto himself, and he dies so that they can be removed from us. In an act of washing away, forgiving our sins, he dies for us on the cross. And then he's exalted. He's resurrected from the dead. He's raised up and lifted high. And he does that in our place so that you and I, too, can be lifted up, that we, too, can be raised up. Whether that's being raised up literally from the ground in which we'll be buried one day, Every one of us has a, has a faith that we're going to reach. But in Jesus Christ, we're raised up so that we can have eternal life, not just life here, but life in the world to come. And so Christmas is this time when Jesus fulfills the promise. It comes from the book of Zephaniah, right? It's kind of a strange book in the Old Testament. But the book of Zephaniah tells us this at the very end, that there's a time coming when God will be present with us which is what happens at Christmas. He comes to be present with us. And this God who is mighty to save will wash away our sins, will lift us up, will give us life. And then, and I love this, this is the way it all ends. And then this God will sing a song over us. You know, we come on Christmas and we sing songs of praise to God. And God sings songs over us. Like God has written a song about you. It's an amazing story. And so the invitation to all of us, in a few minutes, whenever we come and we share in, the, in communion together, we take bread and the crushed fruit of the vine as elements that remind us of Jesus' life and death and resurrection from the dead so that you and I could have, that we could have life, eternal life. And Christmas is about that life. It's about remembering that life and celebrating that life. And for some, it's entering into that life. And it may be that today is a great opportunity for you to enter into this life that God offers to you in Jesus.
What a great story, the story of Christmas. I want the kids to come forward now. You can let your kids, just let them run. It's okay. You just send them out. They knock somebody over or something over. Sorry, we can clean it up. You know what I mean? So bring them up here on the, come on, guys. Y'all sit, I'm going to sit right over here. What are we doing? Y'all get up here. I don't know what you're doing. Not getting into, no, sit down. Sit down on the ground. Sit down. Face me. I'm going to talk to you. Come on. Now, some of you are thinking right now, whose idea was this? That was yours. It was Caroline's idea, she said. Y'all, come on. Come on up here. That chair's broken. It is a broken chair. Thank you for that. That's, if I fall, will you pick me up? All right, come on, guys. Y'all find a, a seat. Grab a seat on the ground. Moms and dads, don't worry. If they get out of control, I'll, I'll take care of them, right? So. I love it. Come on, Cash. Come on up here. She's like, I'm not going up there. I don't know that guy. Thanks for coming. All right. All right. Guys, I am so proud of you guys. So happy for you. Come on. Bring the bunny rabbit, too. It's awesome. Come on. All right, you know, listen, let me tell you, Christmas is a great time, right? Anybody excited about Christmas? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no kid, man. So this is Christmas, Christmas Eve, right? Yeah. So does that mean yesterday was Christmas Adam? No. Oh, you got to. <laughs> Your mom told you that one as well. All right, well, here we go. All right, so this is, and, and thanks to Micah, this is Christmas Eve with Pastor Steve. You know what I'm saying? So it sounds, sounds right. Listen to me for a second. Man, when you and I think about Christmas, there are probably a lot of things you have in mind, right? Are y'all going to have dinner tonight or something like that? Yeah. Are you having, are you having some presents? Are you going to get some gifts this year? Yeah. Did you go shopping for your mom and your dad? All the, the yes kind of knows like, no, didn't go shopping. That's okay. There'll be time. All right, let me, tell you, let me tell you a little bit about the Christmas story, remind you of some very important elements from the Christian, Christmas story that I don't want you to miss out on. Does anybody have a, like a nativity set at their house? Anybody in a nativity set where you got the little manger, right? What else is in the nativity set? Got a manger that has the baby Jesus in it. Yeah, you got to have baby Jesus. What else? You got Mary and Joseph, the wise men, so a camel, some other animals, yep. Yep, what you got? A star? Does anybody have a donkey? A, a donkey? Yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yep. A cow? Yeah, all sorts of animals. Shepherds? Yeah, all right, so listen for a second. So listen, there's a reason why you have all of those things in your, in your uh, nativity set. And it's because of what the, yeah, the angels. So listen up. Here's what the Bible says in telling us the Christmas story. So the, all throughout the Bible, there are things that God promises are going to happen, right? So, for example, God promises to us that he is going to draw the nations to himself, okay? Now, here's what he means by the nations, people, right? And so there's a, there, there needs to be this picture of people coming to God, of coming to Jesus in order to know him, and that's the wise men. So the reason why you put wise men out is because the Bible tells us that you're going to have people from all nations are going to be drawn to him. And so the wise men, they're coming like from a distant land. They're not from right around there. They're coming from a distant place. And then you have God saying that he's going to bring his own people to himself. And that's the shepherds. So you have shepherds there because that's the, the picture of fulfilling what God had promised was going to happen. He'd bring people that were, were his chosen people to himself. You also have in the book of Numbers this promise that whenever, uh, the, whenever Jesus was born, when the king was born, that there would be a star that would come in Numbers 24. And so that's the reason why you have the star that shows up in the heavens that the wise men followed in order to get there. You also read in the, in the Bible that the angels are going to celebrate and rejoice. And so you have these angels that are there in your, in your nativity set as well, right? The reason why you have the animals there is because the Bible tells us that that little baby, Jesus, was the one who created everything that exists, right? Any, every animal that lives, every plant that lives, every planet in the universe, that that Jesus was the one who, who made him, who made them. 
So here's the thing about the Christmas story, guys. Look at me. Pay attention real quick. So whenever you and I think about what happened on that night in Luke chapter 2, the passage that we read a few minutes ago, what we see is that God comes to be with us, to be present with us, and to draw him to himself, to call him to himself. We got a runner. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. It's awesome. We got her. Okay. All right. Hey. Wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's enough. Drink that. Okay. All right. So here's the thing. Back to the Christmas story. So here's what happens on that morning, right? When all of those things are going on you're thinking about, where does that happen? Do you remember the name of the, the town where it happens? Oh, little town of? Bethlehem. Now, let me tell you what Bethlehem means. Here's the, sto- here's the part of the story I don't want you to miss. Here's what Bethlehem means, right? So the word, the, the, the word Bethlehem means the house of bread. Can you say that? House of, house of bread. So here's the thing, right? When you and I talk about bread, when the Bible talks about bread, you and I talk about food, right? We use the word food for that. So it's like the house of food. Now, what does food do when you eat it? Yeah, that's right, nourishes you. Not, the, not, the, not, not just, you know, you don't just eat it. It makes you nourished. It makes you strong. It helps you to grow. So here's the thing about Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem is the place where God comes so that you can trust in him. And in trusting in him, it's like, it's like eating food. It's like having nourishment so that you can have life. And so the Christmas story of the little baby who was born in Bethlehem and the shepherds that are called off the hillside to come and to worship him, and the angels that show up, every bit of that, every bit of that story is God saying to you, I've got a great invitation, a great gift for you, that by trusting in Jesus Christ, you can have life. You can have life, okay? Let's pray together, and you can run back to your moms and dads, okay? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for coming to us in Jesus to give us life. Thank you for these boys and girls, and I pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys head back to mom and dad. Hey, was that fun? (laughs) Of course. We good? The mic's not on, I don't think. Huh? Is the mic on? Okay, go ahead. Today we are reading from Luke 22, 25 through 38. At this time, a man named Simeon was living in Jerusalem. Simeon was a good man. He loved God and was waiting for him to save the people of Israel. God's spirit came to him and told him that he would not die until he had seen Christ the Lord. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to do what the law of Moses says should be done for a new baby, the spirit told Simeon to go to the t- into the temple. Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God. <clears throat> Lord, I am your servant, and now I can die in peace because you have kept your promise to me. With my own eyes, I have seen what you have done to save your people and foreign nations will also see this. Your mighty power is a light for all nations, and it will bring honor to your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were surprised at what Simeon had said. Then he blessed them and told Mary, This child of yours will cause many people in Israel to fall and others to stand. The child will be like a warning sign. Many people will reject him, and you, Mary, will suffer as though you had been stabbed by a dagger, but this will show that people, that, I mean, what people are really thinking. The prophet Anna was also there in the temple. 
She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. In her youth, she had been married for seven years, but her husband died, and now she was 84 years old. Night and day, she served God in the temple by praying and going without eating. At this time, Anna came in and praised God. She spoke about the child, Jesus, to everyone who hoped for Jerusalem to be set free. And now we will light the Christ candle. Bow with me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you also, dear God, for the story that you have just heard, the story where a seeker was able to find Jesus before he passed away. Today, sometimes in our busy world, we don't seek Jesus like we should. We seem to find other things that absorb most of our time. But let us always remember as a church and as a, as a congregation here that it is part of our job to seek Jesus and to seek his way and to do his way and to follow him. Be with us now as we go forth to the rest of this service. Be with us, guide and direct our every path. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. morning, we come to uh, the time in our service we get to celebrate uh, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is uh, a way that we as the church remember uh, the death of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead to give us life. Uh, there, there are two elements that uh, we partake of during the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. There's bread and there's the crushed fruit of the vine. When the Bible tells us about bread, it uses this picture of the way in which we become nourished in order to receive life and tells us that Jesus is the bread of life. And so when we trust in Christ, we receive him. And we eat bread this morning as a symbol that we have received Jesus. And so in a few moments, whenever the elements pass by, the bread that you have is a picture of for everyone who has trusted in Jesus, it becomes a remembrance of that, of that fact. If you've not trusted in Christ and you don't know him, then the bread that those around you will be partaking of becomes a symbol to you of what's offered to you. It becomes an invitation, right, to come and to share in a meal, uh, this, this meal of, of receiving Christ. There's also the crushed fruit of the vine. In the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us that the first human beings, um, they partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where God had told them, don't, don't eat of that, of that tree, the fruit from that tree, and they did it anyway. They crushed that fruit, and having done that, they, they lost life, and they lost the delight, the garden of Eden, the garden of delight that God had offered to them, and you and I suffer as a consequence of that, but Jesus has come to restore that to us, that that garden of delight, that place where God's presence is known. And so whenever we partake of the crushed fruit of the vine, it's a picture to us that Jesus was crushed on our behalf. And it becomes for those of us, us who have trusted in Jesus a remembrance, and perhaps for those who have not trusted in Christ, it becomes yet again an invitation to you. Receive Christ and trust in him today. The way this will work is some deacons are going to come forward now. If you're not already here at the front, if you'll make your way down to the front to help uh, pass these uh, elements out, we'll hand these elements out down the aisles, and you can take one of, these, uh, one of these packets that have the elements in them, or you can let it pass by. Either way, it's not a, uh, there's, there's no shame, there's no offense in letting it, letting it pass by. But if you've trusted in Christ, take one of these, these packets of elements and we'll share together in just a few moments as we'll eat of the bread together in unity with one another and drink of the cup following that with one another as well. So let's pray. And after we pray, we'll distribute these elements to you and then we'll share in this wonderful meal together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for all that the, the Lord's Supper uh, means to us as a way to remember your good work in Christ to reconcile us to yourself. And so use this time uh, to strengthen our faith and to draw our attention to you and to you alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
the bread is on the underside. You can take the bread out. The bread that you hold in your hand is a symbol. It's a picture to help you and to help me to remember all that God has done for us in Jesus. Bread that was broken, that was distributed, that was scattered, so that in partaking of the true bread, the bread of life, Jesus Christ, that we might have hope and healing, nourishment, our time of great need. And so in the midst of the darkness of the world that we live in, I invite you together to take this bread and to remember Jesus Christ as you eat it this morning. The cup that you have in your hand, the crushed fruit of the vine, is a symbol, a picture of death, but not just any death, the death of Jesus that uh, was to take away your sins. The fact of the matter is every one of us has sinned against God. We're all separated from him because of sin, but God has come to wash all our sins away. The Bible tells us in the book of um, Ezekiel that what God has done in Jesus is to pour out water over us so that we can be washed free and we can receive the very Spirit of God into our lives. And as we partake of this symbol today, it reminds us that God has come to dwell among us and to dwell within us by means of His Spirit. And so take this cup and drink as you remember Christ. There's an invitation to all of us to turn our attention to Christ, to look to Him, to receive Him, to follow him, our good and our great God. So listen to scripture together. This is John 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man, man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, Christmas is a time, as Steve alluded to before, of lots and lots of traditions. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to meet yet, I'm Bradley Eves. I serve as a minister to students here at, at Woodland. This is my wife, Frances, and our daughters, Caroline and Collins. Uh, and we've got several traditions that, that we do every year, some that uh, began in, in our own families of origin when we were children and others that we've decided to begin 
Uh, we debated a lot about which ones we're most excited about this year, and I think Frances would agree what she's most looking forward to is tomorrow we'll sit down with the girls and we'll read the Christmas story, uh, albeit in a child-friendly version uh, from a storybook Bible that we have. And we'll get to talk with Caroline in particular about what that means and why we're opening presents and why we're celebrating uh, and what it's all about. I think my favorite Christmas tradition is probably this afternoon, we're going to go to a restaurant and eat appetizers and desserts. We don't normally do that, and we try to do that every Christmas Eve and be a little bit of a blessing to the person that serves us our food. Um, and so uh, we, we invite you to think about the, the traditions that you enjoy uh, and what it is that you'll be doing with your family today, tomorrow, and what those things mean uh, and why those things are valuable. Here in just a moment, we're going to pray, and then we're going to close with Silent Night. Uh, and it's an interesting song. I think it's a great song to reflect on this afternoon or this morning uh, as we think about the fact that, you know, it's often not a silent night. I don't know if you can tell, but it's not a silent night in my house. It's not a silent moment right now. Uh, and maybe you, ref you, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can relate to that. It's not a silent night in your house either. Uh, and maybe inside it's not a silent night either. Uh, maybe in your heart your anxiety uh, and your, your troubles uh, aren't being very silent either. Um, and what we realize is that in Jesus, in the celebration we have of the Christmas season, of him coming to this manger, and not just staying on the manger, but going on to hang on that tree, brings us peace so that now you and I can truly enjoy silent night. We can truly enjoy a peace with God. And so let's pray together, and then I invite you all to sing uh, Silent Night with us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for the reality of Christmas. Father, that we don't lead meaningless lives, but that there is a purpose and an order to the world and to all of history, that you're telling a big story. Father, that you're telling the story of your love for all of humanity, and that in that story, you became one of us, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And so, Lord, as we celebrate today and tomorrow, and we rest and relax and enjoy time with family in the days to come, Father, I just pray that it would stay forever at the front of our mind Everybody. what this is all about. The reason why we're celebrating is that you have become a man. You've come to be with us, to be one of us. And that in your life, you paid for our sins. You lived the life we couldn't live, and you paid the death that we deserved. And we now are invited into relationship and peace with you. We thank you so much for it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to close out with Silent Night. We'll diminish the lights and the candles that you have in your hand. Go ahead and flicker them on as we, we begin to think about what it is to worship Christ, not just now, but in the hours and the days to come. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome every single one of you here to come back and worship with us 10 o'clock every Sunday morning from here on, hopefully throughout eternity. We've got a home here. We want you to be a part of us, to join us in studying the scriptures and in doing the work in the ministry of the gospel together. So if you would, please stand with us and let's sing Silent Night.
Refreshments in the fellowship hall. Go in the love and peace of Christ.